Hi, I'm Mike Dilk and you're listening to the Relax Back UK show. The show that explores all kinds of health topics relevant to you, your family and your friends. Each week I talk to expert guests from a range of backgrounds to inform and entertain you. So please do join the Relax Back UK family and stay tuned. Hi, and thank you for joining me, Mike Dilk, on this week's Relax Back UK show. Now, recently, the Chancellor, Jeremy Hunt, at the last budget, which was on March the 6th, March the 6th uh, announced that he wanted to invest, invest £3.4 billion into tech within the NHS and try and save £35 billion. There was actually no mention if, if this £3.4 billion was uh, more than what he invests usually uh, each year in the NHS. But anyway, moving on. Is this possible? What areas of tech need fixing and what areas could see some real savings from this investment? I talked with Sam Vollens, a trauma orthopaedic surgeon who really is at the sharp end of what happens in the NHS. Actually, the NHS digital side of things, I think, also requires investment at the very basic level. Um, right. You know, when we're still sending letters out to patients for appointments and sending more letters to the same patients to cancel those appointments and then another letter to rebook them. We talk about simple stuff that could save some money and also some more involved topics such as virtual wards. Please do join us for a peer into the future of the NHS. Good right so my guest today is uh, Sam Bollins and he's uh, he's a surgeon um actually what sort of surgeon are you i don't, I don't think I, I've, I've seen that in the what i've been sent yeah i'm a trauma and orthopedic uh consultant surgeon i do uh predominantly arms in adults and children um is, is my main interest so i try to stick to the arms if, if at all possible but i also do the major <laughs> the major trauma work so we, we take whatever comes in on call and i've got some great colleagues who manage legs and other bits and i tr try to stick to the arms okay so you're you're, you're the arm expert Exactly. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Um, and the topic is kind of the NHS and increasing efficiency. Yeah. Um, and this was brought about by really the budget recently, because Chancellor Jeremy Hunt revealed plans to modernise and get better, better productivity using IT, AI and sort of high tech in general uh, with, yeah. in, within the NHS, which, you know, on the face of it, sounds like a, a, a very good thing, a jolly good thing. Um, yeah. How, how much money did he say, right, we're going to invest into the, the NHS now? Is there, is there sort of a, a, a price tag for this investment? Do you, do you mean in terms of the how much money he wants to invest in it? That's right, yeah. yeah. yeah so, I mean, I think the, this... the figure he gave, I think, was £3.4 um, Right. You know, and I'm guessing that that's a small in, uh, increase from, from what he normally invests in tech. Um, but I think the... The nature of the investment is it sounds like an incredible amount of money. But when you look at digital and the use of digital innovation across the UK, um, there's a lot to do. And uh, I think you you just said, you know, fa fancy tech, AI, all these kind of things. And I think that's the, the way that innovation digitally is going in the world. But actually, the NHS digital side of things, I think, also requires investment at the very basic level. Um, right. You know, when we're still sending letters out to patients for appointments and sending more letters to the same patients to cancel those appointments and then another letter to rebook them. Yeah. Sometimes well, I have. There, there, there's lots of different strands to this. Oh, yeah. Police car just went outside. I don't know if you I don't know if that came <laughs> onto the recording. It's gone there. It's all right. Um, but he, he gave another figure of what he was hoping to save, which was yeah, like that's... extraordinary. What was that? It was about 30 billion, wasn't it? It was 10. Yeah, 10. The, one, one, the one I saw, 35 billion. I, yeah, I thought, goodness me. All right, that, that sounds like worth having. Yeah, I think so. And I think the difficult thing is realising that 35 billion, isn't it? Because we can all look at business cases. We In the NHS, we constantly have to write business cases to innovate. We have to yeah. show that it's going to save money, but it's about realising that investment. So that might be through cutting out the unnecessary admin tasks for human workers and changing that into robotic processes, which saves on staffing costs. It might be printing costs, paper costs, you know, it's, yeah. it's a, and it all well, adds up. I, I, I mean, I, I, I was looking at this a little bit and, and 
you know, frankly, there's not a great history of this because it's, it's been some attempts have been done before. And I did a little digging and then there was something the UK National Programme for IT attempted to implement uh, what was called a top down digitalization of healthcare for the NHS. And I had I had to read that. It doesn't trip off your tongue, really, does it? Yeah. And it was launched in 2002. So a while ago with a budget of six point two um, billion. And uh, it, it didn't really go anywhere and was shelved, kind of cancelled uh, in 2011. Mm. So there's not a great history <laughs> to this. What, what, what's different? Is it going to work this time? <laughs> and if so, why? It's, it's really difficult. You know, I'm a clinician. Ultimately, I do some work for a, a digital company um, who specialise in patient facing solutions. But the difficult thing is, is the levelling up. So the phrase that the government uses is levelling up all NHS units across the, the UK into the same level of IT, I guess, um, accessibility. And that is electronic healthcare records. So you hear his speech in the budget. It's about making all records electronic. And when you do that, you can then it then opens up doors to utilise the tech that we're talking about um, in the patient's hands or clinician facing to be able to improve that efficiency. The difficult thing is levelling people up. And when you go around the country talking to different units about where they're at, there are some units that just haven't had the investment to be able to level up their electronic healthcare record system, which then alienates them from the tech that improves efficiency so you're trying to go to them and say oh you should have a patient portal where patients can access their own medical records but they're like well we can't have that because our electronic healthcare record system doesn't talk to any of the current portals available because they speak a different language so it's it's very it's very i completely agree with you that the investment only is a good thing and going to work if the country works together and commercial sector and NHS facilities work together to quickly level up all NHS facilities, whether that be secondary care, primary care, social care settings, nursing homes, you know, rehab centres. If we level up to the same standard of of electronic healthcare records, it then opens so many possibilities. Well, I mean, from a selfish point of view, if, I, if I'm in Leeds one day and I have a serious accident that hurt my arm, you know, you exactly. said you're, you're, you're a specialist. I want you to know all about me. Absolutely. Before you kind of yep. stick your scalpel in. It, I, I... <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And the, and the nature of the beast, this is exactly what I'm working with with a digital company. The nature of the current system is that unless your local secondary care facility uses the patient portal, that we use in Leeds teaching hospitals and we're the second busiest major trauma centre in the UK, I won't know about you. I'll know certain details about you, your demographics, maybe your drug history, maybe some allergies, but I won't know your resuscitation wishes. I won't know your, you know, all the the minutiae of your medical history. And and that's really important. And I and I believe as a clinician, and I think my my patients agree from a lot of work we've done in Leeds to audit this. Patients want control of their healthcare, whether that be having it on a mobile device so that you can you can share it with a clinician when you go into a hospital, or whether it be making decisions about your healthcare at any given stage. Patients do want that. It needs to be delivered in different ways so that we don't exclude certain groups of people. Um, but I think that's the key: is patients, like you just said, you want control of your healthcare and be able to share that with people when you want to share it. Yeah, I, I suppose cause I'm lucky because I've been relatively healthy so far. I don't know if I, I'm more interested in the control thing or you being able to find out about me when it really matters. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's, Maybe a really, that's the same thing. In some well, no, it's not. You're absolutely spot on again because the thing is, is I, what I struggle with is I know as a clinician that you as the patient want that. You want me to know what I need to know to make any decision at any given time. Yeah. However, the whole system is set up that we, we require your consent to access your information. Right. And, and even when we, we have that consent, the digital systems that we currently have don't enable me to pull that data into a simple, understandable format. And I think that's the panacea of digital healthcare systems. And it's what we're trying to do in the company I work for called Walola. We're trying to work with UK um, data systems to be able to pull data when patients want us to pull it. But the yeah. problem is it's set up 
to pull through healthcare systems. And if the healthcare systems don't allow you access to that data as the commercial sector, the patient can't give us the information. So it is a bit, you know, it's almost like we need a national consent system for patients, like donation, organ donation. Patients just say, yep, yeah, I'm an organ donor unless I withdraw consent. Perhaps all patients in the UK should be told, unless you tell us no, any NHS facility in the UK can now access your data through a, a secure network. Maybe that's sure. a, a thing. All right, let, let's let's park that kind of topic because that actually could get, that could be a, a, a mini series, and yeah. we can sort of go into the philosophical philosophical way information is held that that sort of thing. But but what uh, the the chancellor kind of suggested and is putting this money forward is it going to all be on this one massive project or is it lots of small projects and are they divided into sort of organizational type things and medical type systems as well you know what what's is is there an overall plan i think so yeah i think there's a there's a, a plan if you look at what he said there was some clear statements in there leveling up so getting everyone on electronic healthcare records is now probably number one and then we jumped straight into um, what I would call classify as hospital facing or clinician facing solutions or digital facing solutions. So these are the investments in making sure that we're up to date with our cancer standards, our cancer weights, using artificial intelligence and robotic automation to try and learn with machine learning how any given patient should potentially behave on a pathway. And all of those I would classify as of, as clinician facing or institution facing systems and and whilst that's really important i think there's been a huge investment in clinician and institution facing systems and there's been not a great deal of investment in patient facing digital innovation so right. uh, i really you know trying to focus on the phrase kind of person centric rather than patient centric we see everyone as a patient whereas actually we're all people and we all want different things from our healthcare, and it. I think that isn't wasn't perhaps mentioned in what they had to say about the 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 three point four billion. And I would like so this, to see is this is this things like trying to make sure people don't miss appointments, you know, because yeah, think things like that. Yeah, I would call so I would call that a very straightforward process investment. So on the the level up um, money that was given a few years ago, it is expected that that patients should be able to access their appointments, rebook, reschedule, cancel their appointments through an electronic solution, which tends to be through the NHS app using a patient portal system. So I would I would put that early on in that journey of digital innovation. And, and a lot of units, I don't know whether you in St Albans, but certainly in Leeds, we now have the ability for patients to rebook um, their appointments through a digital solution using NHS login and NHS app. What what yeah. I'm talking on? Okay, well I, I, I'm I'm all for uh, really good use of appointments. So, for instance, my local dentist, uh, I just got a a text from him this morning. Yeah, you know, machine generated. I've got an appointment coming up in a couple of days, and it's uh, a reminder. And, yeah, you know things like that, really useful. Yeah. However, having said that, in 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 St Albans, um, when a, when you go to your uh, your GP and he says, right, you need a blood test. He used to give you a letter and you trot off down there and you queue up, not for very long, 20 minutes. You could go the next day. Sometimes it might be a bit longer if you went at lunchtime and everyone pops off at lunchtime. But actually, generally, the system worked pretty well. And I never waited there a long time. I mean, I'm pretty healthy, so I haven't really used it that much. Uh, and it wasn't an issue. Last time, um, I went along thinking it was the same system. But actually, no. You've got to make an appointment. And I had a look at this yesterday because I knew I was going to be talking to you. The next appointment was March the 25th. Yeah. Where, whereas before, I would have just gone along with my holding my bit of paper, my letter, and uh, they would have taken my blood. But they, they, they seem to have kind of mechanised the whole thing. And um, may, I don't know, maybe they've evened out peaks and troughs and how many people they have taking blood. Uh Perhaps the whole thing's cheaper, but from the patient's point of view, I, I looked at it and thought, "What? I can't go until March the twenty fifth. Yeah, it doesn't seem quite as good." Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think the key thing is what again, clinician, what clinicians are saying. You know, from my work in digital, is that 
we don't want to invest in digital innovation for digital innovation's sake. We've got 3.4 <laughs> billion to spend. Let's not spend it on something that's not useful for the person, the patient. And <clears throat> and that's frequently what we see, that there's loads of investment in hospitals and clinician and institution facing digital, but actually they don't think about the patient journey. It's got to be more efficient. It's got to work for patients and every patient's different. They are a person. Some people like face-to-face -face consultation, others like, you know, a telephone, others like video, you know, me, I as a clinician can't, I don't see the use in the video consultation, whereas a telephone consultation is perfect you know, for me as a clinician, but for some patients, they want to see the whites of my eyes. If you're going to have an operation done by me, you're not going to want an operation without at least seeing the whites of my eyes and believing what I've got to tell you. Um, so I think, you know, I completely agree that any digital process that's brought in has got to be person centric. It's got to be for the patient um, if it's a patient facing service. Um, and I think there are some things around accessing remote care. For example, if you've got a text message saying you need a blood test, you can go to any of these five units, the hospital, your GP practice, a neighbouring GP practice, a blood centre, just go and help yourself. And they all knew that you were coming for your blood test. That would be a good innovation, wouldn't it? You're like, yeah. well, I'm, go I'm popping into town today. I can go and have it done in that drop-in centre, in the shopping centre, you know. And those are the kind of things I think the NHS are looking at doing, particularly for imaging, where you could perhaps drop in for a scan at any one of a number of units and that scan would immediately um, immediately appear back in the right place for that clinician to make the decision. That's one of the 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 things that, that the NHS digital are talking about is is remote imaging and access to imaging. Um, all, all, all this stuff sounds eminently sensible. Um, but there was one example that really just jumped out at the, the, the page at me, and, th and that was... Um, how much you could potentially save on stamps if, oh, if, yeah. you, if you kind of cut down a lot on sending people letters and communicated kind of electronically or via an email. I mean, maybe you can't do that with everyone, but the, the, the figure was enormous. Yeah. So I think we, with um, Walola, the company that we worked with, um, if you had 10% of your patients in a big hospital, so 1.5 million hospital if only 10% of your patients use digital letters, that would save you £150,000 per year for 10%. So it's it's insane. Yeah, I mean, and that, yeah. that, yeah, that's, that has got to be quite a simple thing to do. I, I would yeah, absolutely, thought. yeah. Yeah, and digital letters are so great because as soon as that's approved, that comes onto your smart device or, or accessible online on a computer. And we know that there's roughly only, I think, 30 to 40 percent of over 65 year olds aren't don't have a smartphone so the majority of the country 90 96 percent of 16 to 24 year olds have a smartphone and you, you can do them multilingual you know you've got it written in english so you can use translate programs to translate those letters so it's hugely digitally accessible for the majority of the country and it's the minority that aren't smart savvy that you still might have to post letters to and a lot of the systems coming through including the system that you know i represent um, which is portasana have the access to say well i don't want my letters digitally I, I want them posted and that automatically speaks with your healthcare facility so they know they're posting your letters so yeah. you've, we've got to think about digital inclusion now um <laughs> and try and avoid digital exclusion through languages or disability. And that's something that on the commercial side is very important to, to companies. Yeah. Another thing that um, did cross my mind, but probably really because it's been in the media a lot recently, what with COVID, and that's procurement. Now, I, I, I don't yeah. know how the NHS procures things at the moment. Um, it, if you look at, 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 at the news in times of trouble, it's kind of down the pub, with your mates um I, i'm sure there is a, a, a system but i don't know could that be um this kind of these, these kind of things it ai could that be used to help procurement yeah i think so and i think the so procurement we have a lot of different uh, digital companies that are doing some great work in in procurement of actual um you know what i would call things so all the things we use for surgery are all have barcodes and they're scanned and when you scan them the system knows that you need to reorder it it's all automated now so anything um 
of substance within the NHS can be put on, you know, robotic reordering. Even locations now um, in Leeds Teaching Hospitals, we use a location system where you know that a patient from a QR code is in a particular part of the hospital. You know where they're being sent. You, you know, you know where items that the hospital own are. So there's lots of there's lots of things in that kind of aspect of procurement. I think the procurement of digital is a very interesting topic because <laughs> the 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 government specify or NHS digital now NHSE specify that we need to use incumbent providers. So we need to use what we've got already in the system and it's all got to sit behind the NHS app. But if you look how many digital solutions are integrated with the NHS app, it's not many. And there's hundreds, if not a thousand great commercial companies with great digital solutions that can't get into the system to use their products. So whilst the clinicians are, and I hear it every day of the week because I do some clinical leadership in digital in my own trust. Whilst clinicians are like, I really want to use this system. My patients love this system. We we say, unfortunately, you can't use that system because it doesn't talk to our electronic healthcare record system. If you want it to, you have to pay for it. Who's going to fund it? There's no money. But we've just been given 3.4 billion. Oh, yeah, but we're not using it on that. We're using it for robotic processes to try and save staffing shortages and we're using it on x y and z whereas your cohort of patients which might be small in the nhs's eyes but you maybe you're in it you know maybe you've got a chronic disease mike that needs a great app that can monitor your blood sugars remotely you can do your blood pressure remotely and you can upload that to a system that your diabetes specialist can see in the hospital but your hospital have decided that's not what they're spending their money on they're spending it on something else mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. and it's it's a shame because there's so many great solutions and i think there needs to be a bit more transparency in how we get great companies behind this door that they call it the nhs app um, to enable patients to start to be able to see their clinical information in the palm of their hands or on their computer at home yeah in, in, interesting all right well so there is a, a, an element of you're not on the list. You're not coming in. I think if you try and talk to the NHS to, to sell them anything, you know. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, then how can you get on the list? Uh, that's uh, I th I think actually quite difficult, potentially quite murky at the minute. <laughs> it is, and I think <clears throat> that's probably. <laughs> I've never thought I'd say in a radio interview no comment, but I think the thing is, is is that is murky, and I think the whole commercial the world is a murky place and i think the one thing that i really believe in is that we have to be transparent with the country's money this is state money 3.4 billion of the country's it's our money, money actually it's, our, it's your money it's my money yeah correct and therefore if i know that there's a great solution that can't be delivered because of a human barrier. It's not a computer that decides who gets in and who gets out. It's a human barrier. Um, they don't, they perhaps don't see the strengths of the system. They perhaps don't see the cost benefits. And if you only work with people who are in, it becomes quite cliquey, doesn't it? If you look at a, you know, a club, the old boys club, it becomes cli cliquey because mm -hmm. you only let people in like you who who get on with you, who talk the same language as you. But actually, if we're going to be digitally inclusive. We need to let people in that aren't like you. Um, and I think we need to learn from that kind of history um, in digital. So it's something that yeah. I, I, I agree. It's murky. And I really, I, I, I find it difficult to um, hold back a bit um, because, you know, it's politically charged. Yeah. But, but I just said that, you are, you, are, you are a director of one of these companies that was knocking on the door, aren't you? So. You know. Yeah, so I mean, well, I'm I'm a healthcare advisor, so it, I I help develop the system in Leeds um, and develop a patient facing module for the management of chronic diseases. And the great thing about it is, it's completely adaptable to the specialty. So it's what we call system agnostic, which is really important. And just very briefly, in mind, any commercial solution, in my opinion, shouldn't be connected to money. For example, we've got a lot of digital solutions that are that are produced by implant companies. If you use this hip replacement, 
we'll give you a great solution to digital. Well, if you don't use the hip replacement, you don't get that solution. So it's value added. What we need the state money to be spent on is is system agnostic solutions, solutions that can work with any provider in any system and don't only work with certain people because that's the best value for money. Yeah. All right. That, that sounds very interesting. Again, actually, potentially uh, that might be a topic for another series. Yeah. <laughs> so, so maybe let's put that to one side again and yeah. just explore again a couple of the kind of medical type uh, things that this technology can help with. And you, you, you've mentioned a couple, but just some examples might be good. Another one that interested me, virtual wards. Yeah. Now, that, that sounds uh, interesting because on the whole most people prefer to be at home i'm assuming it's something to do with remaining at home explain a bit more about that yeah so i mean there's a again there's a number of different categories of people that we have in hospitals if we just look at the ward to start with we've got a number of people for example who can't go home because they've got no one at home with them for one night to make sure that they're okay maybe after an operation or an anesthetic so if you're able to discharge those patients day one and provide them with support overnight for example send them home with all their painkillers. But if they've got a question about which painkillers to to take, there's access to that medical advice overnight. If they need to monitor their blood pressure, will they get pre-assessment before their operation? They get given a remote blood pressure monitor. They get taught how to use it so they can check their blood pressure every couple of hours. It can be seen centrally. We can work on that. We've got diabetic monitoring. You've got even falls monitoring now where, where, patient, where similar to alexa or those kind of things they can sense a patient's movement around their own home learn about how they move and actually detect people who are going to fall looking at they're not moving as much they're looking a bit wobbly and they can alert that to a central um kind of repository saying this patient's not right there's something wrong with them and you can reach out to them there's so much great tech in remote monitoring and so you plug that into a central facility like a big teaching hospital and you have a consultants, nurses, OTs, physios who are managing those patients remotely. And you can send an OT out and say, you know, quick do it. You know, maybe we need to change your walking aids. Maybe we need to check, check your toilet seat height, your seat Occup- height. OT, occupational therapist. Occupational therapy, yeah. So you're you're in a hospital, there's an OT on tap, but you don't need to be in a hospital bed to access that help and care. And it's just about thinking differently and that's one cohort of patients and then the other cohort of patients are chronic disease management. So people that with chest infections that you might need to monitor their oxygen saturations. So you, they can have a sensor on their finger that's Bluetooth. It can speak to your phone and that can speak to something centrally. So that you know that someone's saturations are improving or they're going down and then you can give them a call. Are you OK? Or access them how they want to be accessed. You know, send a district nurse out. There's there's loads of options. And we so know the, 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 these things kind of exist already and are yeah. in use within the NHS a little bit or or not. What, what's the deal? Yeah, no. So they do exist already and they became popularised, I think. And again, everything accelerated during the pandemic. But yeah. to keep people at home um, who want to be at home, I think, is the key. There will always be people who want to be in hospital. But I think the better the facilities get and the technology gets and the support surrounding that gets. I think more and more people will want to be managed remotely. A- a- absolutely. I mean, I, if I was given the choice of of being at home or in hospital, I'd, I'd choose at home, I, I yeah. guess. But there, I, I'm sure people have asked you, um, OK, this is all very well, remote monitoring, da, 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 da. but what about, you know, the human touch? What about a bit of bedside manner? Because there's no question that that matters. I mean, for some people Absolutely. more than others. Yeah. I think that's trust, isn't it? So I think that human touch, um, you know, and just seeing the whites of the eyes and knowing how someone, their, their manner is. And when I do a ward round in a hospital, I frequently say to a patient, because I'm an arm surgeon, maybe they've got a broken leg. I say to them, look, I'm here. I'm on call. I'm here to check you happy. I'm here to answer your questions. I'm here to tell you what's going on. I don't have any skills in managing your leg. I've got some great colleagues that are doing that. But I'm here for that reason. And it's amazing the the feedback you get from that. They're so thankful just for being there and chatting with chatting to them and with them uh, about their journey. And I think that's about trust. 
So when you when you get that, that develops the trust relationship, which then enables you to remotely manage someone because they right. trust that you uh, are doing. It. And we know that uh, that engagement through digital is far better if your first contact is face to face. I can imagine so, that. Yeah. So if you have a if you have a chronic disease, you can bring someone in. Unfortunately, I'm sorry to say you've got diabetes. You know, it's a condition that's well managed. But we have a great system here where we can remotely manage your sugars. We're here when you need us. We can call upon you when we think you need to come in. But otherwise, we don't want to affect your quality of life. We want you to live your life. And we can be sat in the background remotely monitoring you. And th- and that's diabetes. We can do that with musculoskeletal aches and pains, millions of patients every year. We can do that with hip replacement, knee replacement monitoring. We can do it with renal medicine. We can do it with transplant medicine. We can do it with pre-assessment. And that's the beauty of having a system which faces the patient and faces the clinician and works with two-way um, communication because you have the ability to reach out at any given time. And that's, okay. yeah. All right. You've covered lots of areas where it either this stuff has already been used, could, but could be used more, can potentially save lots of money. One thing that I let, let's sort of bring it back to you. You've meant you have, personally have mentioned some areas where it could help you, but as a surgeon yep. that specialises on people, you know, who have been in accidents or or what have you, how can this kind of stuff help you help them? <laughs> yeah. So we, I mean, I can give you an example that I, be, made me become a health care director of of uh, Wallola, which was that um there's a thing in, in the country you may have heard of it if you've broken anything called a virtual fracture clinic virtual fracture clinics are now well established across the uk within the nhs and they're essentially triage clinics so you break a bone you don't get brought back to the next available clinic to see a surgeon you get a telephone call saying hello you've broken your foot mike we're going to bring you back to your foot and ankle surgeon in a couple of days and, and we'll take it from there whereas during the pandemic we went one step further we we developed 14 completely virtual pathways, co-pilots, if you were, or care companions to take patients from a fracture through to discharge with no face-to-face contact. And so what that includes is a video like this of me saying, hello, Mike, Uh, my name's Sam. I'm an orthopedic consultant specializing in arm fractures. You've broken your arm and I'm going to take you through over the next six weeks to three months, your diagnosis, your recovery and your rehabilitation. And then it goes into all your physio, your diagnosis. We show you an example of your x-ray. We educate you about how to take on and off your splint or your sling. We give all the frequently asked questions. We give you an opportunity to reach out at any stage of that pathway. And we've put now a third of our new face-to-face patients within our unit in one specialty on 14 pathways. Um, And we've put... um, them on completely virtual pathways we don't see them face to face and they're discharged virtually at the end of their three-month program to recovery and in terms of the cost savings of that to the nhs this is all using the portasana portal with walola as the company the savings to the nhs is around three hundred thousand pounds per annum for all of those patients that are managed remotely we're saving a third of a million and that's just 14 pathways in my area so hang, hang on, that's a third of a million per patient? Per annum saving for those 14 pathways. So because we're no longer seeing them, right. that's a third of a million of the NHS money that is not required to deliver that service. Yes, there's the digital investment. So if you if you um, balance that against the cost of something like a patient portal, like Willola offer in Portasana, the annual cost of that is around, I think, a third of a million for a whole hospital and we're talking about 14 pathways in one specialty balancing that investment so what that was said in the budget of 10 times the return that's a very good example of a significant return using digital in fracture management which is what we've popularized in leeds right okay I, I, all, all this does sound wonderful i have to say uh, how do you feel about it? Are you going? Are you thinking, right, this is going to be wonderful. This is going to work. We're going to see a lot more patients a lot more effectively, help a lot more people and save everybody's money. Yeah, I mean, I feel very excited about it. I think I also feel very frustrated about it. 
because you're, well, you're when, on the sharp end, aren't you? Let's find... Yeah, when you when you show yeah, true. When you show that to clinicians, they and and specialist nurses and people that are running the services, they are absolutely this is what we need. We know the patients. We know that the majority of our patients would absolutely love this. We can alter the pathways according to what the specialty is, et cetera, et cetera. The, the reason why it's frustrating is because digital innovation is slow. And it's, I think it's correctly slow. So I'm thinking of my colleagues in governance and risk who would, if they were here with me, that they, they would know that I, I believe this. We've got to be very careful with how fast we take digital. I think there's a lot of considerations of data protection, of making sure that a system has safeguards in place so that we don't miss a fracture that then falls apart and the patient comes to harm. You know, we haven't had any formal complaints or being sued over virtual treatment pathways, but but actually we did, we've did. we done eight, nine years of this. We've learned over eight, nine years how to deliver this. And the worry is if we push AI and push robotics too fast, this high-end innovation, everyone's talking about robots and AI, and we forget the basics Mm-hmm. that's what I'm worried about and therefore the frustration comes in because we can't innovate quickly and we can't roll it out across the NHS these great solutions we have because of that we're just being held back as clinicians because of the risk and the governance which is the right thing because you want to know that we're protecting your data but you can see how that's frustrating when you think you've got a great solution and and it took a pandemic to take a lot of risk didn't it you know, like we're just going to launch a vaccine, launch yeah. a vaccine and vaccinate everyone. And it, and it worked, you know, but the, 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 there are lots of issues around that, um, you know, about quickly launching digital solutions and not thinking too much about what, what the risks could be. In, in, interesting. And it does throw up an awful lot of kind of really quite interesting, almost philosophical uh, questions for sure. Yeah. Oh, it's huge. It's really it's huge. It's a fascinating area. Well, you've given us a really wonderful introduction. So so thank you very much. If, if people have been listening and think, you know, actually, this stuff is really interesting. Just as a potential patient, I want to found, find out more or in any which form. If people want to find out more about where all this stuff is going, what are some good resources that they can you know, have have a good uh, a good look at? Good rummage yeah. through. Yeah, well, I think every patient, if it's a patient, should be registered on the NHS app. I think it's really important to be asking your provider, your GP or secondary care facility, whether you have the ability to access your your clinical information through the NHS app. Um, obviously, I'm a healthcare director for Wallola, who make Portasana. That's an example of a patient portal. And you can access the Wallola website. And they're an Irish tech firm that specialise in this kind of stuff, virtual wards, remote monitoring and, and pathway work. Um, but the NHS England, you know, website's full of the plan for digital and how they're going to in- innovate digitally. Um, and um, it's, a, it's a, a long read, but it's a good read to see where the journey of the NHS is going. Um, but, yeah, no, I think if patients... Are is, it, able... is it aimed at people like me or do you have to be like a medic? Well, I, well, it's not uh, definitely not aimed at medics because even I struggle to understand some of the language used. But it, but the, the, there's lots of stuff um, through the NHS website that's patient you know that's um that's understandable for patients and i think um just reaching out that way and i would strongly advise that patients speak up so speak up to your gp practices secondary care providers about there's really good patient groups about what you want in digital and that ultimately will steer the funding streams if patients okay. want this as solution absolutely fascinating uh Thank you so much for spending the, uh, the time to chat. I really do appreciate it. Yeah, Thank you very much, you. Sam. Thanks for your time, Mike. Cheers. Thank you very much to my guest today, Sam Vollens, trauma orthopaedic surgeon, talking about technical investment within the NHS. And thank you to you for listening and have a healthy week. Until next week. Thanks for listening to the Relax Back UK show. Join me, Mike Dilk, again next week for more fascinating interviews and chat. If you're listening to the podcast version, please subscribe, like and share it with your family and friends. And have a healthy week. Until next week.